On the morning of September 8, 1760, the city of Montreal in New France surrendered to the combined forces under the command of General Geoffrey Amherst. The terms of capitulation signed by the French governor included the surrender not just of Montreal, but of the colony of New France in its entirety. In the days following the surrender, the city's narrow streets would be flooded with thousands of British troops, as well as French refugees from the countryside who had fled the approaching British armies. Among those packed into the city was an exiled Scotsman named James Johnston, who history would remember as the Chevalier de Johnston. Johnston was no ordinary Scotsman. He was a wanted man who more than likely would hang if ever caught by the British. During the Jacobite Rebellion in Scotland 15 years prior, he had served as a personal assistant or aide-de-camp to Bonnie Prince Charlie and had subsequently fled Great Britain for his life after the Prince's defeat at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. And up until 1759, he had served as the personal assistant to the Commander-in-Chief of French forces in Canada, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm. Now, after having narrowly escaped being captured by the English in Scotland, England, as well as in Louisbourg during the 1758 siege, he would need to mastermind his escape from Canada. But more importantly, his escape from the gallows. Early one morning, just as the sun is rising, Johnston is awakened by a banging on his door. Startled, Johnston opened up to see a towering man in a scarlet red uniform, a British soldier. Do I have the honor of speaking to Mr. Johnston? The soldier asked brusquely. Johnston froze. After being on the run for nearly 15 years, had the Chevalier Johnston finally been caught? Que tous ces bons vieillards seraient dans le paradis. Voudrais bien que tous ces bons vieillards seraient dans le This is the lost world of Cape Breton Island. It's the aim of this project to reconstruct the lives of people long gone, walk roads that no longer exist, and retell events from Cape Breton's history through the documentation left behind by those who saw it for themselves. These primary sources tell the stories of a long-forgotten landscape, each one a thread in the tapestries of Cape Breton's vivid and engrossing history. It's our hope that these stories, some of these never before told outside of official documentation, bring back to life long-forgotten moments from Cape Breton's past. The Chevalier de Johnston was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1719. According to Johnston himself, he was a descendant of the House of Johnston and the Marquess of Annandale, who was a peer of Scotland. Historians note that Johnston's relationship with his father was rocky at best, while it seems that his mother, also related to nobility, was overly indulgent. In his late teens, he spent time traveling outside of Scotland to visit relatives in Russia and also resided for a time in the bustling metropolis of London. Because of his birth, he enjoyed a privileged upbringing among the Scottish elite and would benefit from close ties to influential Scottish nobility like Lord Rollo, Lord Ogilvy, and Lady Jane Douglas. In 1745, when Charles Edward Stuart landed in Scotland to reclaim the throne of England and Scotland for the House of Stuart, it was by way of these ties that Johnson was introduced to Prince Charles, his military entourage, and the Prince's political supporters known as Jacobites. Johnston would begin serving as Bonnie Prince Charlie's personal military assistant, or aide-de-camp, on the spot. Johnston varied his duties as the circumstances required through the early days of the Jacobite Rebellion, fighting at the Battle of Preston Pans, the Battle of Falkirk a couple of months later, and finally witnessing the defeat of Prince Charles' army at the Battle of Culloden in the spring of 1746. In typical fashion, and not surprisingly, Johnston would survive by stealing someone else's horse from the battlefield. After escaping Great Britain and arriving in France, he accepted a position in the Compagnie Franche de la Marine in New France, 
where he would go on to serve as the personal assistant of the Chevalier de Lévy, and later on to the Marquis de Montcalm, commander-in-chief of the French forces in Canada during the 1750s. But first, he would serve eight years in a place that he colorfully referred to as his purgatory, Louisbourg, in the French colony of Ile Royale, known today as Cape Breton Island. The Chevalier de Johnston spent eight long years in Louisbourg from 1750 to 1758, with the exception of a brief return to France in 1751. The story of his time in Louisbourg takes on epically ironic proportions when considered alongside the next hundred years of Cape Breton's history. Cape Breton's French colonial population, who often treated Johnston as an outsider, would never return to Cape Breton after the island's fall to the British in 1758. Forty-four years later, in 1802, the first ship to carry immigrants directly from Scotland to Cape Breton would arrive in Sydney Harbour. Soon, the once predominantly French-speaking island would become the home of tens of thousands of people from Johnston's own native soil, truly transforming it into a new Scotland. The Chevalier de Johnston, at one time likely one of the only Scotsmen on Cape Breton Island, had been in the right place but simply not at the right time. Two documents written by Johnston detail the episodic events that befell him during his eight years in Louisbourg. Firstly, his personal memoirs entitled Memoirs of the Rebellion in 1745 and 1746, and secondly, a smaller document called The Campaign of Louisbourg from 1750 to 1758. It is believed that Johnston deposited his memoirs at the Scots College in Paris before they were rediscovered and published in 1820, while the Campaign of Louisbourg, housed in the War Archives in Paris, was copied and brought to the Library of the Legislative Assembly of Canada around 1855. His writings cover his experiences in the Jacobite army, his subsequent escape from Scotland and England, his exile in Louisbourg, and then his two and a half years that he served in Canada. Both documents are filled with rancid tirades against people he once knew, but swooning praise for others that he esteemed, likely his way of fighting back against the unfortunate hand that he felt life had dealt him. That being said, historian T.A. Crowley admits, although he sometimes erred in matters of detail and frequently bemoaned his unhappy fate, Johnston often wrote with shrewd insight and philosophical reflection. The portion of his memoirs that focus on his time in Cape Breton are often overlooked by historians, who will generally concentrate their attention on his time in Scotland or his service in Canada, but his observations proved to be invaluable for aiding us in our understanding of what life was like in Louisbourg and Cape Breton during the 1750s. Historian J.S. McLennan says about the Chevalier de Johnston's writings, quote, One wishes that more of his literary remains, which were considerable, had been concerned with Louisbourg. To him we owe touches which let us see glimpses of the real life of the place which we do not find in official correspondence, unquote. To truly appreciate the stark reality of life for Johnston in Louisbourg, an understanding of Johnston's experiences in Scotland, England, and France is essential. We pick up the narrative on the 16th of April, 1746, at the Battle of Culloden. Half mounted on the back of his stolen horse, the Chevalier de Johnston fled the field of battle as the defeated Jacobite army fell into disarray. The victorious British began to advance and blocked anyone trying to escape. After outrunning the British cavalry in close pursuit, Johnston turned south and found refuge on the shores of Loch Ness, where he could finally recover some of his strength and figure out what to do in the coming days. He decided to loop back around to the military barracks of Riven, where, to his surprise, he discovered over a thousand Jacobite soldiers waiting patiently for news of Charles Edward Stuart, whom they had not heard from since the defeat a few days earlier. On the 20th of April, a message finally arrived from the prince. Every man for himself. Charles Edward Stuart was fleeing Scotland, and his supporters were now fugitives on their own native soil. The Jacobite rebellion had collapsed, 
and so too had Johnston's prospects. He now realized that if he was going to escape the gallows, his only chance was to somehow get back home to Edinburgh. Once there, he would seek out the help of Lady Jane Douglas, a family friend and powerful noblewoman. No British soldier on official business would dare barge into the residence of a noble. No police searches would be carried out based solely on suspicions. He could, effectively, disappear. Johnston now did what he did best, survive. To evade the British patrols, he would hide inside of a haystack for an entire day in the oppressive summer heat, shelter in the mountains of the unforgiving Scottish Highlands, and smuggle himself across large bodies of open water in the dead of night. At the house of one Jacobite sympathizer who was assisting Johnston, British soldiers burst into the courtyard. Was this it? Was this the end? But to his relief, Johnston says it was nothing more than the soldiers who were fighting among themselves, having exploded in a few fisticuffs. But despite his knack for staying one step ahead of the British, time and again they would identify and interrogate the very people that had just aided him in his escape. No matter where he went, people recognized him as having been with Bonnie Prince Charlie. Against astronomical odds, Johnston slipped into Edinburgh and successfully made contact with Lady Jane Douglas. For his own safety, Lady Jane decided to dress him up as a traveling peddler. Donned with a long black wig, his eyebrows darkened with charcoal, she sent him down to London on horseback, where he should blend in with the other half-million Londoners. Surely no one could recognize him there. But not long after arriving... Two high-ranking members of the Scottish nobility involved in the Jacobite Rebellion were tried and publicly executed in London, and Johnson finally realized that he would never be truly safe unless he fled Great Britain. Then one day news came from Lady Jane. She fancied spending some time in France, and while securing passport for herself and her entourage, had conveniently acquired an additional passport. And so, after a six-month journey of over 1,000 kilometers, Johnston was smuggled out of Great Britain, arriving in France, this time disguised as a footman in the service of Lady Jane Douglas. The France that Johnston stepped into is aptly depicted by a 1748 painting by English artist William Hogarth, entitled The Gate of Calais. Although painted with the intention of mocking France, the artist portrays a scene that a contemporary like Johnson would have easily recognized. Calais' city gate looms imposingly in the background, while in the middle of the street the cook carries a large slab of beef to his tavern. Three mangy-looking French soldiers, their uniforms ripped and torn, stare longingly at the cut of beef while clutching a bowl of watery vegetable broth. Two other soldiers wearing sabots carry a pot of the soup across the street in the other direction. And in the lower right-hand corner, in the shadows of the drawbridge with nothing to eat but an onion and a single piece of bread, sits a Scottish Jacobite exile dressed in a tartan suit. Although Johnston would never find himself out on the street in France, he would soon be able to relate to the poor Scotsman's situation of being down and out in a foreign land. Through his network of highly placed noble contacts in France, Johnston was introduced to the foreign secretary, Puissieux, who arranged a position for Johnston in the French army. In his memoirs, the Chevalier de Johnston explains what happens next, and I quote, Monsieur Rouillet, the secretary of the Navy, ordered an ensign's commission to be made out for me in the troops detached from the Marine to the island of Cape Breton. This commission I refused at first with indignation and obstinacy, being unable to brook the idea of a retrogression so mortifying and revolting to an officer who had always served with honor. And it was only in consequence of the reiterated orders of Monsieur de Puissieux that I at length consented to accept it. I set out therefore immediately for Rochefort to remain there in readiness for my embarkation for the island of Cape Breton, 
the most wretched country in the universe. End of quote. On the 13th of September, 1750, a ship sailed into the port of Lewisburg in Cape Breton Island. As it lumbered past the lighthouse and rounded the island battery at the mouth of the harbor, it became clear to the townspeople lining up at the harbor front that something was very, very wrong. Its sails were torn and tattered, its rigging in shambles, and cables, each several feet in circumference, had been wrapped around the hull of the ship in an attempt to keep the hull from splitting apart. It was L'Iphigenie, a merchant ship carrying troops for the Lewisburg garrison. It had sailed from Rochefort 76 days earlier and was believed to have been lost at sea. Despite being at the mercy of a grossly incompetent and negligent captain, along with endless storms that assaulted the unseaworthy ship, she finally dropped anchor at her destination. The ship begins disembarking her bewildered passengers and crew, and among them is the Chevalier de Johnston. As soon as Johnston's feet touch dry ground on Lewisburg's quay, he somehow gets his hands on a wooden stake and begins swinging at the incompetent and negligent captain of the Ifichini, intent on making him pay for the terrible Atlantic crossing that they had endured. The captain draws his sword in defense, but receives blow after blow from Johnston in the midst of the crowds before the town's Ed Major breaks up the duel and reasserts order along Lewisburg's quay. So begins Johnston's eight-year exile on the island of Cape Breton. Things would only get worse from this point on. <laughs> 